Welcome to the section on computer vision. So now that we've looked a little bit at how to design basic image processing networks for let's say image classification, now let's see what we can actually do with that beyond just deciding whether an image is a cat or not. Um, so the first thing we'll do though is we'll look a little bit more into pre-processing what you can do into different types of fine tuning and so on because this is one of the more common use cases that you will have when you want to deal with images. Let's start with pre-processing in image augmentation. So when you have a picture of, I suppose this is probably a cute mouse or something like that, I think we can all agree that any of those perturbations correspond to, well, one of those mice. Yet it's very different from the original image in some cases, while well, not a single pixel is the same. The point being, these are all image transforms that allow you to explore a larger set of invariants in an effective manner. And so you want to train in a way that is actually robust and resilient to that. Because if not, then you might get some adversarial perturbations that somebody can exploit when running image classification. So here's a real story. So a startup wanted to demo a smart vending machine. So basically customers go and present items to the camera and this worked very well in the lab and then in the showroom, it was a total failure. And part of the reason why it was so miserable is because at CS, the color temperature and lighting and all of that were quite different. And on top of that, they had a lot of light reflection from the disk on which they placed the items. In other words, it did not work at all. So they spent all night to recollect data and to train a new model. Okay. So by essentially tuning the existing model. And the other thing that they did is they got a tablecloth. So that dealt with the reflection. And basically what this does is it tells us that you can sometimes get covariate shift and thus basically data that looks very different from the training data. And in doing that, you get results that are highly undesirable. As a matter of fact, a lot of the cases where people demonstrate that computer vision models fail spectacularly boil down to feeding those models with inputs that look very different from the models that, you know, you know, those networks were trained on. Okay, so let's take a couple of steps towards fixing this. One way is you can go and augment the data. And so you want to have more diverse aspects. So for instance, I mean, you clearly want to have demographic diversity in you know any data sets related to humans, but you might also want to add some background noises into speech. Um, you might want to transform an image into several others by changing colors and shapes and all of that. And while the specifics are just that, while well, they're very specific to the computer vision or you know classification or speech recognition problem at hand, nonetheless, this might give us some idea of what can be done in general. So let's look at a simple case, namely, well, our cat. And you can augment the cat by cropping out pieces or by changing you know, the color. Now, given that, let's say there may be 10 transforms, maybe each of them can be applied, then you would have two to the 10 possibilities. You don't necessarily want to pre-compute that. Instead, you want to compute it on the fly, right? So let's, for instance, look at flip transforms. Well, if I flip a cat from left to right, it's still a cat. On the other hand, if I have the text cat, C-A-T, then while well, flipping that doesn't work anymore. This particular cat, I can also flip from top to bottom. Okay, same cat as before, just now, well, you know, it's left and right legs are switched. But generally cats don't like this, right? So the cat on the right is, yeah, well, nonsense. So you have to be a little bit careful in terms of which transformations actually make sense for which objects. The other thing you can do is you can, for instance, crop 
random part of an image, you distort the aspect ratio a little bit, um, you pick a random position, and as you do this, well, you're making sure that you can also still recognize a cat, for instance, from its tail or its paws or whatever. Um, well, you can, we can do more things to this poor cat. So for instance, we can change the brightness and the hue of the image. And so even though it's a blue or a green cat, it's still a cat. And yeah, I said you can do that, not just to cats, but to lots of other animals. And you could argue whether, you know, some of those are still actually images of that little mouse on the left, but it definitely helps. So there are a couple of libraries like the one uh, from Aliju, um, which gives you a good list of all the possible transforms that you can apply. This keeps on getting augmented all the time, so check out what's there. Okay. So now that we have a fairly resilient base model, let's see what we can do if we want to fine tune that on new data. And the problem at hand is as follows. So MNIST is tiny, and in general, getting data sets labeled is expensive, right? So I might have maybe only 50,000 images for some cars. On the other hand, ImageNet has over a million images, and therefore the hope is that somehow I can use all the goodness inherent in ImageNet to transfer over to this tiny data set. And yeah, I mean, there's base rule that you can use and we can call it meta learning now, but base rule is just fine. Essentially, if you think about it, you know, P of W given the data, it's proportional to, you know, P of data given W. So that's my standard likelihood of my loss term times P of W. So therefore I can get a good posterior P of W given the data by either throwing more data at it or by picking a better prior. And transfer learning essentially replaces P of W with a better prior P pre-train of W. Okay. So for instance, what I might do is I might, you know, take my deep network and I have my feature extractors, which are like the first N or L minus one layers. And in the end, I just have a linear classifier. And so what I could do is I could essentially keep this first feature extractor pretty much unchanged or only change it very slightly, but then just retain the, and retrain the output layer. So I keep the first few layers and then I just retrain the output layer such that if you see the cars, well then at some point I'm gonna do a good job. And so what that means is that I'm going to use all the source features and you can see that, you know, as you start up initially, you know, these are very simple features and then they go all the way up to dog or cat or eye detector features. And then for the last layer, you just keep things. Right? So in doing that, you can get a really good prior and the prior is essentially, well, the first few layers are going to be more or less the same as what we have before. And then the last just gets changed. So to give you a bit more details on that, what you can do is you can train on the target data set as a normal training job, and then you use a small learning rate on those lower layers, or for instance, use fewer epochs, or you actually go and fix some of those layers. And then you can go and reuse the weight vectors for the categories that are shared, if they are shared, and otherwise you just, you know, train from scratch there. Now, if the source distribution is a lot more complex and has a lot more information than the target, then this fine tuning usually works really well. On the other hand, if the target fine tuning task is very complex and very different, then, well, pre-training isn't so good. That's it. By now, pre-training is pretty much a standard strategy for a lot of computer vision and natural language processing problems. And we'll see more of that in both cases. So in the NLP case, this has pretty much revolutionized NLP. And by now models like BERT 
are super popular. So just to sum this up, pre-processing is a really good way of incorporating prior knowledge. And so if you have mechanisms of, for instance, changing people's hairstyles in a non-destructive manner, well, then you will get algorithms that work on people in a more invariant manner relative to the hairstyles. If you can change the lighting, conditioning, exposure, and all of that, you can address that too. And this is really vital for good quality. So as mentioned, one of the performance issues once for an image classifier was traced back to a bad JPEG decompressor. So in other words, pre-processing really matters. In some cases, it's the pre-processing that really gives you the good accuracy on the models. Fine tuning, while well, you really want to do that in practice for pretty much any computer vision problem that you have, your labeled data for your specific problem is probably going to be a lot smaller than the overall amount of data that's available and labeled. And so you want to fine tune appropriately. Okay, and with that, we conclude that first chapter. So there's a lot more to read up on. Um, so there's a lot of image augmentation and fine tuning. Also, um, keep an eye on what's called covariate shift, namely when training and test set distributions look very different, because in that case, there are tricks on how to essentially reweight the training data in such a way that it looks more like the test data. Okay, so with that, we're off with that chapter.